damn shit it is. <laughs> that one was better. Can I tell you a story about this beer, actually? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, are we, we're filming? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, this is called, like, uh, like, I don't know, Brasserie Mont Blanc. And the first time I had this was actually uh, with our team. The like factory or the brewery is literally like in the same industrial park as yeah. our uh, our service yeah. course. And so when I went to sign my first contract with the team, I went to the service course and I met all the guys. And then I went to lunch with like all the bosses. Uh, and like they eat every single day they eat lunch in this restaurant. And uh, so I got there and, you know, I was there to like sign the contract and whatever. And then like we're having lunch and they're like, oh, like, do you want a beer? You know, and I was like, is this a test or like, uh, <laughs> am I allowed to have one? You know, and so then I was like, uh, uh, I don't really know. And then uh, they're like, no, 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 this is really, this was voted the best beer in the world. Apparently it won like the World Beer Awards, best beer in the world or something. And, like, and it comes from across the street and you could look out the window of the restaurant and see the brewery. So then I was like. Okay, if you really insist, then yeah, I'll have a beer. And uh, yeah, it wasn't a test. It was just they wanted me to try the beer, so. Yeah. And it's your favorite one now. Uh, favorite, <laughs> I don't know, but it's, it's good. It's good, so. Here's yeah. cheers then, mate. Welcome to sharing a beer. It's yeah, good to have you on. Yeah. I'm actually really happy we could do this because, yeah. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure with your pelvis whether we'd, uh, exactly. whether we'd get time. But how did you actually break it? So just to, to tell everyone. Yeah, so um, I was in Tour de Wallonie. Uh, yeah, I guess one of the preparation races for the Vuelta. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was feeling really good and it was the last stage. We were on the cobbles and uh, yeah, I was in pretty good position, but I was like, oh, maybe I'll try to like go like really to the front. Um, we had like Greg Van Avermaet in good position uh, for the general. Uh, he was like sixth overall and we were like, maybe we could do something if we could split it, then uh, yeah, we could move him up. And so I was trying to move up on the cobbles and uh, I just went around the outside and just, I hit this giant hole uh, in the cobbles and my yeah front tubeless tire like exploded and then blew off the rim. And then, uh, yeah, I just ate shit. So yeah, <laughs> not ideal. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty rubbish. So. What's the rehab now? You have another week officially off the bike. I mean, I bumped into Larry this morning on the road, but yeah. <laughs> that's undercover. So yeah, I'm supposed to take like three weeks off, you know, maybe a little less than three weeks. Uh, <laughs> tried to start riding the trainer a little bit, seemed okay. Uh, and yeah, so I think from here, just kind of ride slowly take it easy and then uh yeah hopefully starting this next week i can like do like a decent training load and then uh we'll see hopefully get back for the end of the season yeah that'd be nice wouldn't it yeah and back for lombardia then yeah yeah hardest race of the year so <laughs> we'll see but so, it should be good yeah so how did you actually make it into cycling like your us and how like it's for australians it's the same like you have to actually like make a real effort as opposed to the europeans yeah, so actually, um, I kind of got into cycling through ski racing, which is kind of funny. Uh, I used to downhill ski race, and then uh, my local ski club, they did these mountain bike camps every summer for, like, cross training. And uh, I did one of these mountain bike camps. I really, really enjoyed it. And then um, every year in my town, there's a really big race called the Iceman. And, uh, yeah, it was a big mountain bike race. So I did that, like, the first year I started mountain biking. And I just thought it was really fun. It was cool. I was, like... It wasn't incredible. I was yeah. fine, you know. But uh, I had a friend who I skied with, um, and he mountain bike raced a lot. And so he was like, "Oh, if you got, if you want to come with us next year, uh, you know, you can join us to like all the races." So, so okay, that's cool. So uh, yeah, I went the next year, and again, yeah, I was like average, but I just really, really enjoyed uh, riding. And yeah, I kind of just never stopped. Uh, I think I'm someone who kind of, when I get into something, I'm kind of like obsessive about it. <laughs> I thought that was like, yeah, I thought that was an animal, not a <laughs> bug. But yeah, I get into things and uh, yeah, so I just kind of never looked back and I switched to road cycling when I was like 16 and uh, I was lucky enough to get on the national team when I was 17. And then, yeah, I just kind of like slowly chipped away and uh, yeah, I came, I signed like my first pro contract with BMC when I was like 22. So my last oh, year wow. I was 23. Okay, and then, so you went from BMC, where did you go from there? So BMC stopped and you left? Um, no, so I did two years of BMC and then I switched to IM Cycling. Yeah. Um, so that was a pretty sweet team, Swiss, Swiss team. And uh, 
the guy who ran the national team when I was on it, the under-23 national team, he was a Swiss guy named Marcello Albazzini. So, like, I don't know if you knew Michael Albazzini, yeah. but his dad. Um, okay. And so he went to IAM after, um, after he worked with us on the national team, and so he brought me to the team, which was pretty cool. Um, so I did two years there, then the team folded, and, uh, yeah, I found myself at the end of the year without a team, and it was, like, really, really late. And I was lucky to get a ride on Aqua Blue, which started up that following year. And uh, yeah, I did two seasons there, and then that folded again. Uh, so I kind of ran into yeah, a few speed bumps uh, along the way. But uh, yeah, from there I ended up uh, going to Asia 2R, and then yeah, I've been here ever since. So it's a good good way to to spend your career, but also a bit shit having to jump between teams. Fold. Yeah, yeah, it would have been nice to have like a little more consistency along the way, but. Uh, I mean, you have that now, right? Yeah. With uh, with Hazard Tazer, like you've been there four years, the longest of your career so far. Yeah, exactly. How do you find it actually, like the being the French team, French culture? Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Um, you know, the thing is, we have like a we have a really nice ambiance on the team. Um, you know, a lot of the people have been on the team a long time, so the staff's been there forever. I would say, a lot of the staff's been there more than twenty years because the team's been around, I think, something like thirty years. Yeah, wow. And uh, so, you know, it's really it is kind of like a pretty familial uh, environment. And a lot of the guys on the team, like a lot of the French guys, they all grew up racing together in the like development team and then joined the, the pro team. So they all like really knew each other super well. And so then, I mean, it took a little while to, I guess, like integrate into the team, but now it's, it's pretty cool. And it's, it's actually a really, yeah, it's a really nice, like, uh, I don't know, environment between the riders and stuff. Uh, everyone gets along really well. And yeah, it's kind of like, we really enjoy like, shooting the shit around the table, you know, I don't know, it's fun actually, so, so that's pretty cool. Um, you know, it's, it's been around a long time, so there are like, you know, a few old school things uh, that... The I cordial guess, and the yeah. bidens. <laughs> yeah, exactly, syrup. Uh, <laughs> syrup. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, it's like, they're definitely making efforts to progress in terms of like technology and uh, science and stuff like that, so. Yeah, right. And Touching on that topic, what do you think it is that like actually makes you such a good rider? Do you think it's the the obsessive nature that you you spoke about before? Or? I mean, I don't know if I'm such a good rider, but uh, but yeah, I think yeah. But uh, I mean, <laughs> when you talk like compared to other people yeah. in the world, yeah, um, yeah, I think it's just like I really, I guess, I really love the sport, and so I'm just super interested in everything around it so you know training is really interesting to me nutrition is really interesting to me and i'm always trying to like find you know i'm i'm always reading uh i'm you know i think i'd probably be like a better performance director than i would be a cyclist because like i'm always looking for like you know yeah i guess the newest training methods and you know the latest uh studies on nutrition and stuff like that and you know so it's like it's kind of funny uh it's just something i do all the time i don't know i read like a lot of like scientific papers and stuff and I, I didn't even I do it so much that I don't even notice it anymore yeah. and once I was like on the bus and I like got on the bus at this race and like our nutritionist was like standing behind us and uh and then I like opened up my iPad and I just had like a scientific paper you know yeah. like a study and I was just like reading it and he was and our like nutritionist was like oh just your morning like uh <laughs> reading I was like yeah I was like I guess I didn't really think about it that it was like something kind of funny but like I guess that's not something that every rider does but uh but yeah, I do, and, and I think maybe that's something I'm always kind of like, yeah, I just am really passionate about it, and I think that keeps me uh, motivated and, yeah, focused. It's actually something I noticed even more being injured now. I'm like, damn, I just love riding my bike, you know? Like yeah. I, and, and when I couldn't ride my bike, I just, I literally was just so bored, and all I wanted to do was ride, and it made me think like, wow, you know, okay, it's nice because it's our job, but uh, it's something I'd definitely do if it wasn't my job either, so. Yeah. I think that keeps you going, you know? Style, yeah. yeah. So over the 11 years, and well, you're going on to your 11th year next year, right? Mm -hmm. what, what's like the, the biggest change you've seen in the peloton? Because I know that we've talked about like respect being lost with all the new guys, but like yeah. for me, that's just how it's been because there's yeah. no respect in juniors and then I became pro and it was already like this. Yeah. But like you would have seen a, a change in that respect or some other respect as well. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, yeah, I guess a lot of people are like, oh, there's no more respect and stuff like that. But at the same time, I think it's good because I think that's one of the reasons we've seen, like, young guys being able to perform right away. Because I think it used to be, like, 
you kind of got like put in your place. So like when I first came into like the sport, it was like, I mean, uh, you were kind of like bottom of the barrel, you know, like you were like just the piece of shit Neo Pro and like everyone just abused you. And like, uh, and you had to kind of like, you know, earn your stripes and you had to like make your way up. And I just remember like, you know, I don't know, some of the verbal abuse I, I had to deal with when I was like a stagiaire and then like uh, Neo and stuff like that. And like, I mean, I guess it toughens you up, but uh, yeah, it wasn't that easy at the start. And I guess that really kind of like, you know, having to start at the bottom, you kind of really get put into your place and then you're almost like too scared to not be like the first guy to work or the first guy to ride or do, you know, like whatever sort of like, you know, I don't know, the shitty jobs or something, you know? And like, um, and now it's kind of like, they've seen like, oh, young guys can perform. And then now it's just like, well, we're all on an even playing field, you know? And it's not like some young guys just like in his place, you know, he can ride wherever he wants in the Peloton. And like <laughs> that annoys some older guys, but like at the same time, I think it's, it's good because like it's allowed people to perform way earlier than they ever could have before. And I think it's like yeah, a good, good way. And even if I'm not young anymore, it's, it's a good way for like cycling to go. I think, you know, it's like, I don't think guys should have to deal with that kind of shit like uh at the start of their career or ever you know so uh so yeah so it's an interesting take i haven't heard on it before but yeah i mean it makes sense to me why there's guys that just come from under 23s and just destroy it immediately but yeah and then i think the other thing is like uh since i turned pro cycling has gotten so much more professional and then yeah all these young guys are way more professional than like uh they were before um you know i think you pretty much live like a pro from when you're a junior now. And uh, I think that's probably changed a lot. And I think, you know, like when I started, a lot of guys didn't even use power meters and stuff. And, uh, you know, I remember having a teammate, Martin Elmiger, who was a really good rider. And even before this point, he was a super good rider. You know, he'd been Swiss champion a bunch of times and probably won like Tour de France stages and stuff. And then he was like, in maybe 2015 or 2016, he had one of his best like springs ever. He was like maybe top five in Roubaix and Flanders and stuff. And he was like, this is the first time I've ever done intervals. It's, it's revolutionized my career, like uh, these intervals. I was like, you know, I've had a coach since I was like 13 years old, you know? And like, uh, I was like, I've done intervals since I started riding a bike, you know? Like, how could you have never done intervals and you've been like a successful pro, you know? And so, yeah, I think it's just things like that. And that doesn't happen anymore, you know? Like, uh, you can't not do intervals or, you know, it's like, so. I think uh, there's just been a lot of progression in so many of the places. So do you think now that you're like, you've been an experienced all that, do you think that you're like getting better and you're at your best that you've ever been still in your career? Like it gets better every year? Yeah, I mean, I th <laughs> this is like something I've said like a few times before, but like, uh, I think every year I reach my best level, you know? Like I progress every single year but the whole Peloton progresses every single year. So I just stay in the same place, you know? It's like, I'm like, yeah, big, big progress, you know? Like I gain maybe a few percent every year, but then it's like everyone else gains a few percent. So then I'm like, damn, you know, still in the same, but, but yeah, I definitely, um, I think just you learn about yourself every single year. You learn what works, what doesn't work. Um, and I've probably made every single mistake there is in the book and I've tried probably every single thing like every training method every diet every like crazy thing you could imagine um and i would say most of them didn't work um but yeah i've kind of found like what works well for me and uh but it's taken a really long time and i'm still learning you know so uh, yeah what do you, what would you say it doesn't have to be a result but what do you think is like your, the thing that's given you the most fulfillment in like pro cycling fulfillment as in like he, like overcoming something like you might have not uh, got a result from it or like it was just i mean i definitely think like i went through a lot of hard times like you know there was a few times i was kind of on the limit for getting a contract like quite a lot of times in my career and so i guess getting through that was always like uh an achievement for me um you know i think i i think i guess i can be most proud of like having as long of a career as i've had with like as many times I was really on the limit of like not continuing. Um, so I think like that's probably something I can be the most proud of is just like I've been able to have like a long and good career, uh, you know, without, I guess, 
you know, I guess I kind of like skirted by a few times barely. And so it's just kind of nice that like now I've been able to sort of more establish myself. And uh, yeah, I feel like now I'm an important member of my team and like a valued member. And like, so I feel like now I have more stability. And maybe if my teams didn't fold, you know, like I think if I am didn't fold, I would have definitely been able to continue there. And sure. maybe I would have established myself there earlier in my career, but you know, that didn't happen. And then I'm sure the same thing at Aqua Blue, but you know, it's just like, that's the way things went. Yeah. So, uh, so I guess I think, you know, obviously like, um, you know, when I was like national champion, that was a huge thing for me, uh, that like did a lot for my image. And then when I won a stage in Tour de Swiss for me, that meant a lot because like I had dropped from the world tour to a pro continental team and then to win like a world tour race for me was a big thing. But I would say, I guess the thing that I sh sort of am the most proud of is just that I've been able to have as like consistent of a career as I have. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you were driven by like only results and like half of the peloton would be retired like yeah. 20 years yeah. ago. So <laughs> it is, uh, yeah, it's completely different in that respect that when, when you have an injury or something like that's like half yeah. of the goal is just to come back even better than you were before. Yeah. Do you think like that's been a, a big part of like what has driven you is like trying to be a better version of yourself as opposed to like actually just get on the podium and win a race? I think like for me, the thing that's like driven me the most is that like, uh, <clears throat> I feel like I still haven't cracked the code, you know, like I feel like I, I've like, yeah, every year I progress, but I know like that, like physiologically I have quite a lot of like talent and uh, a lot of like capabilities, but like, I know I haven't maximized those. And so, I don't know, every year it's like, uh, you know, I'm not like necessarily getting rich off this sport. Um, so I really do it just because like, one, I love it. And like, I just know that I haven't reached my potential yet. And that just really grates me. Yeah. And so like, I'm like, I have to maximize my potential before I could stop, you know, like, or, or at least do my best effort to maximize my potential. Um, because like, yeah, the fact that like, I haven't cracked this code, uh, that's really hard for me. And I'm like, I'm still working to try to crack that. So uh, the code being like, yeah, trying to get the most out of myself and perform it like my capabilities. Yeah, yeah right. I, I read it, it must have been like a few months ago, like an article you did about like teetering on the edge of burnout your yeah. whole career. And like how you've, I think it's like, how I see it is that maybe now that you've settled in a team and you feel like comfortable and confident, like you've been able to like branch out and like enjoy what you're doing more is that like how you see it as well as like you're enjoying other hobbies that don't necessarily like contribute to your sport yeah i think like for me i think because a few years i was really like on the limit of like staying or or not you know uh, I, I guess my way of dealing with that was just like i need to buckle down 10x you know and i need to like go move to the top of a mountain eat nothing you know like be a monk and what I realized is like, I mean, it took me a really long time to realize that like, that didn't really work for me. Um, maybe like physiologically I could gain a tiny bit, but then mentally I'd be so cracked that like I could only sustain that for a really small period of time. And now like having a bit more balance in my life and just yeah, enjoying things around the bike and everything. Um, just like life here, you know, like it's a pretty sweet place to live. Um, and we have so many different activities we can do. And um, I think that has really helped me be more consistent and just like, uh, yeah, I guess like this year it sucks because I've been injured a lot, <laughs> injured and sick uh, more than I ever have in my career. But I've had like the most consistently high level over the course of the year that I've maybe had in a really long time. So, oh, wow. um, and I think I can only attribute that to like actually just, I've been enjoying myself and I've never like, you know, turn the screw so hard that like, uh, you know, the bolt snapped or whatever, you know, yeah. it's like, I've just like applied a constant pressure that like, uh, you know, it's like sustainable and enjoyable. And then, yeah, so I enjoy riding my bike, but then I do fun activities outside of it. And, uh, yeah, I'm not like too crazy about anything. And that to me has seemed to, yeah, help the most and yeah. I've enjoyed it the most. So on your hobbies then, what do you think you would do if you weren't a pro? Like you love hiking, camping, outdoors, skiing, paddle yeah. boarding. <laughs> uh, I mean, the thing is, is I was going to university before um, and like, 
I think I probably would have done something like in the realm of business or finance or something like that if I didn't become a pro cyclist. But now that I am a pro cyclist, uh, I can't really imagine enjoying having like an office job. Um, so I think I'd have to do something. I mean, it's hard because now I'm in the sport, right? So now I think after my career, I'd like to continue something in the inside of the sport. Oh, really? whether that's like be a trainer, be a performance director or something like that. To me, that would be really cool. Or like eventually maybe start my own team, I think would be kind of like a dream of mine. Try to start like an American pro yeah, cycling right. team. I mean, I think that sort of like speaks volumes about actually being like consistent and not burning yourself out. Because I mean, there's some guys that like, they finish their career and they're like, just like, get me out. Of here. Get me out. Yeah, like yeah. I never want to see this again. So yeah, I mean, yeah. like, you, you must still really, really love it if, if you think that that's what you want to do after then. Yeah, for sure. No, I think like, I don't know, it's just something I'm really passionate about. It's just, you know, every waking hour I'm not riding my bike, I'm like thinking about mm. cycling or something. And like, I know some people think that's like horrible, but uh, I don't know, for me, it's just, it's just the way I am, you know? It's like, uh, so it's not something I really feel like I have like a whole lot of control over. So I don't try to like, mm force it in different ways i mean i try to enjoy doing other things but yeah i don't know i just i just really i don't know why but i i find the sport really cool and uh and yeah i don't know if it's just because it's so hard and then you know getting the most out of yourself is can be really rewarding and so i think it'd be cool to help people do that after uh wow. my career uh, uh and also you know just help guys learn from like the mistakes that i've made and mm -hmm. stuff like that and i guess it's maybe because like I'd like to help people in a way. And then this is some place that like, I have a lot of experience and knowledge over the years that like, I think I would be most able to help people. And maybe if I had done something else, yeah. you know, in life, and then I would be able to help people in a different way. But uh, yeah, I guess this is what I've done. And so that's like, for me, I think one of the places that I would really get a lot of uh, enjoyment out of. Yeah, right. So then on that topic, what do you do in the off season? Like you? Um, well, yeah, I mean, this year I, I actually started skiing again, um, partly inspired by Harry. Uh, you know, it's like so, all the gear and yeah. no idea. When, when I uh, when I was young, I used to ski all the time. I used to ski every single day of winter, so like probably more than a hundred days a year. And wow. uh, yeah, um, so oh yeah, we have little Blanca. Oh. Uh, yeah, so I used to ski probably yeah more than 100 days a year um every day after school and then on the weekends as well and so that was something i really really loved and actually yeah it wasn't until this winter when you were like yeah i'm gonna buy all this ski gear and stuff and try ski mo and all this i was like oh you know i've been wanting to try ski mo and you know yeah i guess for my first five years of my career i think i i didn't touch skis yeah. and just because i thought oh you know it's not good whatever and then i realized you don't have to be like you know, some kamikaze skier, right? You know, like you can ski like as a normal human being uh, without taking excessive risks. So um, yeah, I got some ski gear and I, I really enjoyed that. Um, for me, that was like super fun. Um, and yeah, for me, that was like, yeah, it was one of the coolest things I did this, this off season was just, I started skiing again. Not that I skied like a whole ton. I probably skied seven days or something, but yeah, getting back into that was something I really enjoyed. And then, yeah, we went camping once last year. That was cool. Uh, but yeah, I think that's another thing I started to realize over the last year is that like doing things like going on some kind of vacation or adventure uh, is kind of important. So last year uh, we went to Greece uh, in the off season and both my sisters came with their partners um, and my girlfriend came as well. So it was pretty, pretty cool. Awesome. Um, so yeah, we're planning some sort of adventure, uh, for this off season, but not a hundred percent decided yet where we're going, but we'll probably do like a couple weeks, uh, somewhere a little bit more exotic than Greece this time. So uh, a <laughs> little bit more adventure, but, but yeah, it should be cool. That sounds good. So I, th I think just like trying to do something that totally takes your mind off of everything, uh, is a nice way to shut off and yeah, I guess change the scenery and stuff like that. It's important. Yeah, of course. So a few rapid fire questions to finish off. You've been yeah. teammates with some really iconic riders. Who's your favorite? Oh, favorite teammate or like favorite rider? Um, favorite, favorite teammate, we'll say. That's hard. 
Oh man, this is gonna take a while. We can edit uh, this, right? Yeah, yeah. Most influential person in your career? Oh, most influential person? I'd probably have to say George Hincapie. Really? Yeah, so uh, when I was an under 23 rider, um, yeah, I moved to, so I, I mean, actually it was kind of crazy because like I was going to university, I was gonna take a semester off and uh, I was like, okay, I need to make this work if I'm gonna do this. Um, so I need to go somewhere and find like the best training partner I can. So I was like, okay, I had a friend who lived in Greenville, South Carolina, and I knew he trained with George a bit. So I was like, oh, maybe if I like, you know, go there, maybe I'll be able to train with George a bit too. And maybe, you know, I'll be able to learn something from him. And so anyway, go down. And luckily my friend, uh, Chris Butler was his name. He was on BMC for a bit. Uh, he had a spare bedroom in his house. So I moved in with him. First day we were there, I trained with them, uh, with him and George and whoever. And uh, so yeah, at this time I was like an espoir. And I was okay. Um, I was like on the BMC like development team, but I hadn't really done a whole lot yet. Mm. And uh, yeah, George like took me under his wing and we trained together every single day for like two, three months that uh, winter. And then I went to Europe, raced with the national team, and then I had uh, yeah, pretty much the best results uh, until I was definitely, I, I mean, I progressed like six levels, you know, like, uh, so I progressed really a lot and I was quite strong that, that spring. And, um, that was kind of how I ended up becoming a pro. Um, and then, wow. yeah, I actually went back to South Carolina quite a lot, like quite a lot of years after that and, uh, became really close with him and his family. And, uh, so I think if it wasn't for George, I wouldn't have ever become a pro. So, wow. um, yeah, he really like showed me what it is to like have a good work ethic and, yeah, it just taught me like a lot, you know, just uh, that I guess being a good person uh, is as good as uh, being a good rider, you know, or as important as being a good rider and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, I guess for me, he was probably like my biggest mentor um, and pretty influential in my career. Yeah. So. Favorite race on the calendar then? Oh, that's hard. I think I have to say like Tour de Suisse is one of my favorite races because I always... Uh, it's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. It's always like a really cool race. Um, yeah, I won a stage there, that was really nice, but I just had like a lot of connection with Switzerland. I was on BMC, then I am. So I spent a lot of time in Switzerland and uh, yeah, I don't know, it's just, it's a really nice race and I've always really enjoyed racing there. So that, I also really like Liège, it's pretty cool. For me, that's just a, one of my favorite races. Uh, to My favorite race to watch is Roubaix, but I never want to do it. Uh, <laughs> Also Flanders, but Flanders I would maybe try once. Yeah, but, right. but yeah, to so participate in Liège or Tour de Suisse, I would say. Yeah, right. Blanco. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. New star of the show. Yeah. <laughs> this is Blanco, the dog. <laughs> Sorry, we had a bit of a camera malfunction, but we're back for the last two. So we're in the South France. Why did you choose to move here? <laughs> Because of Blanco. <laughs> um, yeah, so when I first turned pro, I moved uh, to Italy. I moved to a small town called Corata. Um, so I was riding for BMC, and uh, one of our directors, his name's Max Chiandri, Italian British guy who um, now he's a director on Movistar. Um, he lived in this town, and the, the team thought, you know, it'd be good uh, to live close to him because he could help us out. So I moved there. Taylor Finney was also living there at the time. Um, who was one of my close friends, and then uh, Steve Cummings, also um, Kev had a house there, and so so there was a few riders, um, and yeah, it was it was a really nice town. It's a cool place to visit, incredible food, and probably the best gelato shop, two best gelato shops I've ever eaten in my life, which can be dangerous, uh, but but yeah, uh, it wasn't the best place to be as like 22, 23 year old. Mm. Um, it uh, yeah there wasn't really good public transportation or anything and it was a really small town. So it's kind of hard to get anywhere. Uh, and yeah, so I decided at the end of that year, I wanted to move and, um, I knew Joe Dombrowski was living here and he actually was looking for a roommate. So I decided, yeah, why not try coming to Nice? So, um, decided I'd move here. And when I came to visit, uh, I, yeah, I stayed in his apartment and he had a sweet apartment, but yeah, it, it rained for the entire two days I was here. So, uh, I was like, well, yeah, this place kind of sucks, I guess, but, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever, I'll come here anyway. And, yeah, luckily I found out that was not the norm, um, mm. and it's a really beautiful place to live, and, 
yeah, I've been really happy living here ever since. So, yeah, Ian Boswell lived like a K away from me. And, yeah, we became super close friends over the years. So I was pretty sad when he uh, retired and moved away. But, uh, but yeah, a lot of guys here. It's the, it's the best place to ride, I would say. One of the best places in the world mm -hmm. that I've ever been. And I've been most places. Uh, weather's great. And you have the best training partners in the world. So I think it's hard to beat. And you learned French here as well. I did, yeah. So actually, I mean, I'll be honest. I, uh, I lived here for five years before I learned French. So... <laughs> I mean, the problem is it's like, you know, there are a lot of tourists here, so it's pretty easy to get away with not speaking French, uh, as you've probably found. Although you speak, you speak a few phrases, so that's good. I do speak some phrases. Um, but when I signed for Asia Tour, I knew it was going to be really important. Uh, and it just so happens, so I live in this small town next to Nice called Villefranche-sur-Mer, where we are right now. And it just so happens that one of the best uh, French immersion schools is in Villefranche. So it's like, we can see it from uh, here. It's like a five minute walk from here. And uh, yeah, so I decided to go there. And yeah, actually it was a really fun experience. So I did a month, uh, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> French every single day. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was pretty cool because I did one month of that. That was my entire off season. And then I went straight to the first camp with the team. Wow. And I went into full real immersion, and uh, yeah, I really was able to learn just through that. That's crazy. Yeah. And so now you've got yourself a French girlfriend. You speak yeah. the language. Are you planning on going back after your career finishes, or you haven't really thought too much? Um, I mean, I've definitely thought about it a lot, but uh, I think I'd like to split my time between the two places. So I really enjoy life here. It's a it's a cool place to be. Um, you know, it's like good lifestyle. There's a lot of awesome activities and things to do. Um, and then at the same time, I mean, I, I like the US. Everything's super easy, yeah. it's home. Uh, so yeah, if I could split some time between the two, I think it'd be pretty cool. Yeah, all right. Well, thanks for coming on, Larry. Yeah, thanks, it's man. been a pleasure. Yeah. It's good to finally have you good on. To chat. So yeah. there's cheers. Thanks, man. You want some Blanco? <laughs> he loves it.